Thank you very much for joining us for this uh, session where we are going to discuss how COVID-19 has affected the design of fitness, wellness and spa facilities. Today we are discussing the business adaptation beyond COVID-19, the future offerings both from the luxury market and the mid-scale models, the incorporation of technology in facility design and the outlook of investment into innovative design and brand distinction. That's what we're going to be discussing with our speakers today. Right now we have four fantastic speakers to this event. We have Sean Tan, who is the director of True Group. And for those of you who do not know, that is one of Asia's largest fitness and wellness groups, uh, which is established, I believe, Sean, in 2004. Just give you a little nod if that's okay. Uh, the True Group encompasses a number of brands, including True Fitness, state-of-the-art gyms both in Singapore and Taiwan. It also includes TFX, which is their merging of a boutique within a big box gym concept. And it also includes the wellness operations of True Fitness and also uh, Yoga Edition, the premium brand. We also have joining us Barbara Chansey. Give us a little wave, Barbara, if you can hear me. Barbara, just give us a little wave. To the audience. So Barbara is actually the founder of the Design Group. It's an international full service boutique fitness firm. Uh, she's currently dropped out to change her audio. She's like what does in a second. Barbara's firm looks after 200 plus successful uh, fitness studios and it's her job to transform your vision as clients into the most thriving and pioneering black brand for uh, any scale, any location that you wish to deliver. We also have joining us Jamie Waring of uh, Octave. Octave uh, is obviously in Shuzhou in China, but Jamie's joining us now from Australia. He's formerly of Six Senses, formerly of Homes Place, and formerly of Boko Hospitality. So he has a number of different roles in his past and present where he has been both in the operator and provider side. He now works with China's foremost well-being destination retreat called Sangha Retreat. And there they deliver a fusion of mindfulness with Eastern wisdom and Western science, delivering both world-class fitness operations with nutrition, psychotherapy, and life coaching, as well as traditional Chinese healing. And last but not least, we have Andrew Mahadavan, who is joining us as the Vice President of Life Fitness from Hong Kong. And they are a global leader in commercial fitness equipment, helping people lead active and healthy lives through their family of brands, which includes Hammer Strength, Cybex, Index, Cycling Group, and Byfit. And they are distributed in over 125 countries, I believe. So thank you all for joining me today. And first of all, we're going to ask you as the panel for the first question, which is how are you re-sketching or adapting your renovation plans in anticipation of the changing guest behaviours or expectations that COVID is bringing? I'm going to start this by asking Andrew for his input. Sure. So I think uh, what we're seeing from our customers is really two separate buckets. So we have existing customers that have clubs that have already been open for several years. And then you have new customers that we're anticipating to open clubs in the next two to three months. So if we look first at existing customers, we're really kind of in a, uh, I guess you could say a redesigned phase. And essentially what we're trying to do is help our customers uh, move different pieces of cardio equipment, move different pieces of strength equipment um, to help make sure that consumers, when they come to the space, feel that there's enough social distancing and feel that they're confident that the gym is clean and they have enough space. Um, we actually recently, this was in the last week, we published uh, publicly a reopening guide and it's it's available to all uh, to where it actually has a set of guidelines, everything from training your staff to welcoming your members back after your gym is allowed to reopen from a government perspective. For, for new customers, we're starting to look at different business models. And what I mean is, um, 
we, we know that over the next three to four months, as, as Ronnie said in the e-note, everybody's kind of anticipating three to four months uh, until things get back to normal. We, we know that membership bases are going to be a little bit lower. We know that it's going to be driven by consumer confidence in the gym. So how can we as an equipment supplier uh, enter a new gym uh, with lower CapEx, lower ongoing OpEx, help operators get profitability faster, and then come in in later stages and fill out the rest of the gym from an equipment perspective based on consumer confidence and government regulations. So that's, I mean, that's really high level, the two different buckets that we're seeing this in. Excellent. Thank you for that contribution. I'm now just going to go firstly, until Barbara comes back on, to Sean and then to Jamie for his, uh, for his input. Sean, go ahead. Thanks, Blair. Um, I like the way uh, Andrew um, sort of distinguished it between existing uh, gyms or clubs and new ones, because that's exactly how we look at it. Um, for, you know, design is very much driven about how the management in, in the clubs um, see the future. And our future at the moment is a little bit murky because we don't have um, you know, a full view of what COVID is going to do to the industry, the confidence levels, and how people are gonna you know, see returning to the gyms. We can take the lead from countries which have reopened, and we are heartened to see that a lot of them are reporting you know, 70, 80% um, uh, membership, uh, you know, which are returning. Um, but as far as the true group is concerned, for our existing gyms, are we gonna do some major redesign? No. What's really gonna happen is we're gonna comply with whatever uh, the government regulations are as as to do with safe distancing and capacity controls. So if we have to space out the equipment a little bit more, if we have to block off alternate pieces of equipment, we will do that. Um, but as for full redesign, no. I mean, our cost structures are fixed somewhat. Um, you know, our leases are locked with landlords and until and unless we can, I guess, get out of those leases and, or, or perhaps renegotiate those leases, we won't be doing very much. Um, the other, the other thing that is sort of pushing that also is I think COVID-19 uh, will bring about consolidation in the industry. Um, you will see, unfortunately, some players dropping off and, um, the longer the stretches, the more will drop off. Um, that may mean opportunities. Um, so we may be able to pick up assets instead of building a new, we might be able to pick up assets and that sort of falls within, um, the existing gym category. But if we were to build new gyms, I think that's the interesting part. Um, if I had a blank slate and I had to go in, how would I redesign a new gym? Uh, assuming there's no vaccine found, there's no herd immunity, but what I do. Um, I actually think that we might be building smaller gyms, less equipment. So like Andrew said, less CapEx um, will be spent so that we can space out everything a little bit more. What might be interesting is to build and, and to actually push ahead on that luxury and the premium market because people will remember what has happened during the lockdowns. Now, if you ask someone, would you be comfortable working out in a, in a crowded gym again? If you're not sure whether or not COVID will come back again in the winter months or, or who knows, right? Or some mutation or some, some other form. But if you tell someone, if I, if I give you a space where I charge you a little bit more, but it's premium, it's luxury, and in today's day and age, what that means is better spaced out, better planned. So even things like your showers, your changing rooms, a lot more space, because those are one of the, the areas where um, even gyms which have reopened in part, um, they're, they're shutting down, you know? So that's... that's that's all uh, I will say at the moment, Blair, but uh, happy to contribute more later. Yes, no, that was great. I, th I think you're, you're spot on there, my friend. I know that some people have also tried to introduce the kind of kill box or isolated cube areas in their uh, redistributed for one person, uh, several materials there for them. I'm going to come now to Jamie and then I'll come to Barbara last for the input on this question, which is the first bullet point. So Jamie, just to have you follow on from uh, Sean and uh, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Sean and Andrew, some good points. I mean, look, I think, first of all, um, this is not going to be here forever, right? You know, we hope it's not going to be here forever and we hope we see, you know, things are moving now. You know, over the next few months, hopefully we'll get back to some kind of form of normality. 
But, you know, the fundamental question or the fundamental point is around business models, right? Because the truth is, and I am I kind of you know, had a career in developing fitness brands, but also hospitality. And fitness brands is challenging because it's a model mostly. You know, it's a high volume model. And the productivity to a meter is really worked out in the basic feasibility of the business model. You know, and without this work, hence we will see some consolidation, no doubt. Now, if you're moving into hospitality, I mean, especially towards premium luxury, you generally have a bit more space. You know, you generally have a bit more ability to have flexible spaces. You know, whereas in the gym, you know, if you have a volume model, you know, each square meter is, is excellent. Each square meter is kind of worked out to make your numbers work. Um, so I think it's one of fundamental looking at the business models, which means, you know, your cash work. You know, this is, this is the real challenge. And I think to go now into a redesign, right now i think it's difficult for operators it's difficult when the truth is a cash flow is uh, an all-time low <laughs> and i kind of put money into capex and redesigning is not possible it's really survival mode right now and i think it's the current operators need to find a way of you know, scaling back from some of the variable costs to make sure they can survive you know i hear people not getting many breaks on the lease contracts and you know so it's, it's tough from my point of view yes if you can develop space guess the future proofs this thing kind of happening to some degree but again it's challenging you're thinking you know the operators have to look back or look at the basic business models and play these different scenarios to try and kind of you know to to make it solid and robust against these things happening because once we get over this who's to say that another one doesn't similar situation doesn't arise in a year 18 months you know, so I think it's we need to look at more flexible business models. We need to look at the productivity of space, and again, the, the, the business model from the ROI perspective to make sure that you know we can see different scenarios and survive these kind of situations. I think James, you've answered that question fantastically well between the the three of you. Obviously, we we lost Barbara for a second. She's hopefully going to come back and join us. I'll try and come back to her on this a bit later. But I do agree with all of you. The the audience currently right now is very aware that this this situation has posed a great problem to a lot of businesses. But as each of you had said, it's something we have to prepare for for the future in case there's a resurgence or in case something else develops in one, two, five years time that puts us in a similar position and we have to uh, try and adapt to all offerings. I'm going to now ask the, the next question and hope to come back for her input on the, the last uh, part. So moving on, I'm going to ask each of the panel now, with the inevitable constraints around building new facilities based on the fact that most people are still recovering, will we see a narrowing of the overall offerings which are going to be offered by both the luxury players and the mid-market players. What's going to change, gents, and ultimately what will remain unchanged? So if I can go back, first of all, to Andrew and get his input on this. Yeah, th this, is a, this is an interesting question um, because I, I think Jamie hit the head of the nail where he said this, this isn't forever. You know, this is going to this is going to have a three or four month tail but then things are going to somewhat return back to normal. So if you really look at, uh, let's let's break the three categories, because if you think about life fitness and what our business is, we're a commercial equipment supplier. So we study these segments very, very carefully. We know the sizes, we understand what the trends are, we understand what the growth rates are rel relatively closely from each of these segments. So if you look at HVLP, so budget, and if you look at mid-market, so if I think about the US, like in LA Fitness, and then you think about luxury, as Bar Barbara said in the introduction, Equinox, and you think about those three, I, I really struggle to see um, at this point in time being able to kind of predict whether the gaps will narrow or whether the gaps will widen. Um, but what I actually think is kind of interesting is instead of looking at the segments themselves, because again, those are driven customers, customer behavior. How are they going to feel coming out of this? Do they want to spend more on wellness? Uh, is their personal economic situation to where they don't want to spend any money on, on anything other than the necessities? I, I, I don't think we know. But if they, I think if we look at the main players. If you think about the HBLP segment, Planet Fitness. If you look at mid-market and think about Anytime Fitness. And then if you think um, and, and, and think about those two, okay, so that's mid and, and, and uh, budget. And then you go to PE groups. 
like uh, Evolution Wellness, like FLG, which have a whole scale from from uh, entry level all the way up to uh, you could say, you could say luxury. I think those are really going to be the groups that expand. And as uh, I've heard consolidation several times already during the session, I mean, I think those are the ones that are going to be growing from a global scale. So I don't think it's really going to be segment driven. I think it's going to be more customer driven. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to pause for now. I'm going to circle back to Barbara, if I may, for her response to the first question. So, Barbara, just in terms of your answer to how businesses are re-sketching or adapting their renovation plans in light of the current crisis, uh, what do you think at that point? Barbara? I think we've lost Barbara again. I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay, so uh, for, the, for this part in time, I'll come back currently to Sean for his answer on the second question. So, Sean, with the restraints that you mentioned on new building because of limitations, what do you see the offering is going to be like in the landscape between luxury and mid-level players? What's going to change and what will not change? Um. Again, I, I, I sort of agree with Andrew. I, I, I don't think it's altogether clear right now whether the gap between the luxury, the mid-market, and, and the budget is going to either widen or, um, or, or narrow. The opportunities are there for the operators to widen the gap. So those which have deeper pockets, um, if they're prepared to spend, um, my bet would be to spend um, on the luxury market and to push that even further. I think there is opportunity to do that. Um, but I think more than a differentiation in, uh, or, or in, in, the segment, in the segment itself, I think what we will see operators have a, have a big rethink about is that whole revenue model. Um, I think what COVID has um, opened the eyes uh, of many operators uh, is whether or not the pay-as-you-go model is the way to go or whether something along the lines of a recurring revenue. So we have a lot of budget gyms uh, and boutiques which have been on the pay as you go. And what we have seen is during this crisis, um, they are the ones which have been hardest hit because if you can't open, or if you open with limitation as to size, um, that's going to hit your balance sheet really, really badly. Um, but if you have a recurring model, at least you have a bit of an opportunity to maybe Tell your tell your members not to suspend for a period of time. Uh, we were in that in that boat, so we have a percentage of our members which did not suspend. That gave us a little bit of cash flow to sort of help us ride out this this period. I think that's where we will see a change, and with that change, um, I think it'll still fall within the three market segments: your your premium, your mid market, and budget. I don't think we'll see immediate changes in that. Okay. Very, very good. Okay, so I'll come to Jamie next on that same second point. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, you know, as you first of all, I have to reflect back, you know, the big crisis of 2008, 2009, you know, what happened? Yes, I'm on well, and you're in. The economy fell, fell apart. You know, we, um, what happened with the consumer? I mean, we tried to position things to walk away from frivolous, right? Things which seemed not non essential, meaning that. People, you know, during this crisis, when people have less money, the wellness industry continued to grow, you know, based on the fact that people moved away from perceived uh, things which are essential, but actually made investments into their own personal wellness. Because in times of crisis, people do think of their health and wellness. So that was in 2008, 2009, which was just more a financial crash. Now with COVID, which is directly linked to health and immunity, we have a real opportunity. And I think that's to say first of all in regards to the segmentation i mean i think my personal opinion is that market will become squeezed most i think people will actually be polarized a little bit i think people will move towards luck they're in that segment anyway and people will also be looking for deals because obviously so many people will be hit financially having said you know who knows what will happen but what is clear to the value proposition becomes really important, regardless of what segments, you know, budget, mid-market, luxury, question the value they get from that product. So if people are luxury, they need to luxury really well. 
um, and you know, because people's every spare penny will be looked at and challenged. So I think the value proposition of all operators needs to come into play and see what they're offering, see how they can bring in, you know, certain things which position that they give to their, their customers. Excellent points, Jen. I think the uh, the audience is obviously even expressed in live chat their agreement with many of the, the points that you've discussed there. And you're right, I think that the, the luxury model now is going to be in future, where there's going to be a lot more investment. And the mid-market model, we'll see how, how long this crisis affects particular regions and the businesses within those regions will affect those models much more in time as well. Uh, hopefully, we'll have to watch this space for a little bit, but most of your predictions and your current uh, thoughts on this, I think, are great. I'm just going to move swiftly on, because Barbara's currently uh, having some issues with connectivity, to our third point of the day, which is incorporating into your facility design. When and exactly where is it necessary now? If I can come firstly to uh, Andrew for this, and then I'll come to Sean, and then to Jimmy last. Andrew, you go ahead. Yeah, great. So I, I think the, the basics are still there. I mean, retention is going to be key. How do you use member management software to retain your members? How do you use it to manage your facility? I, I, I think that that hasn't changed. That is just absolutely critical for businesses to be successful, uh, and, it's, and it's accelerating. Now, what's been really, really interesting that we've seen through this COVID-19 crisis is the rap rapid adaptation and creation of digital products to try to keep members engaged at home. I mean, I, even, you know, if you think about life fitness, we, we sped up uh, production on Digital Coach, which was a, a digital workout at home product, and we launched it in, in record speed. I mean, it was, it was absolutely incredible. What's going to be really, really interesting to me, though, is if you, if you look at the Pareto chart of all of the different digital products that have come out in the last 90 days, not a lot of them have a really solid connection back to the club itself. So they're, they're extensions of the club, but it doesn't seem like they're fully integrated as part of the club. And so I think from a digital experience perspective, this is definitely going to teach us that you need to have some kind of digital experience from a workout perspective to augment your gym experience. The question is, what is the next step and how does that look when it's actually paired more closely to the club itself that is launching that software? Excellent point. Very good, my friend. And I, and I do appreciate that actually you were extremely fast as a brand to get on the digital footprint and uh, launching that through. It was impressive. Yeah. I agree. Uh, so congratulations to you and the team on that. So uh, moving swiftly over to, uh, to Sean for your input. Well, I think, I think there are several aspects of technology. Um, I think what uh, there will be some basics of technology. I think that we'll see all gym studios employ things like your, your check-ins and cashless payments, um, contact tracing, all of that I think will be expected. That will be the new norm. Um, but as for equipment that we have, um, I mean, we, we use a variety of equipment and, and, and you know, like Live Fitness Matrix. A lot of the brands already have a connected solution. Um, but the question will be, you know, if we, if, if we look at COVID and we see that digital online fitness that one can sort of do at home as well, um, is sort of going to be the mainstay. It might not replace what we have in the physical clubs, but it's an add-on, it's complementary. And if we as, as, as a gym uh, want to continue that engagement with the members, I think we have no choice but to have something online as well. Now, how do you, how do you sort of ensure that stickiness with your members? Because I, I've, I've said this before, once you go into the online world, we're no longer competing on, on location. And equip, a piece of equipment, something we've learned from, from the likes of Peloton and, and Mirror, may be what brings us uh, that, stick, uh, that stickiness. So the challenge would be how do clubs, how do gyms find pieces of equipment that somebody can also have at home? Um, you can do your, create your online workouts around that piece of equipment. You can retain your members, continue to engage them should they want to work out at home. But you can still draw them back to your clubs when you need to, when they're comfortable to come. It's it's a, a complementary solution. That's how I see it coming. Um, it will be a challenge to find what that piece of equipment is or, or what the solution is. But um, there are a lot in the market, and we need to keep on looking. 
Excellent. You're absolutely right. We need to keep researching. Everyone's learning during this crisis. Everyone's trying to adapt and change at the same time. Potentially, that's why we are here with uh, all of our audience who are listening to, to all of you for your insights, and hopefully they can deliver some of theirs by the chat. The more we work and unite together, the more solutions we have. More voices, more solutions. Moving swiftly over to you, Jamie, what's your input on, uh, on this particular point? So, um, you know, I think it's a similar point to me for the market segmentation in a sense that, you know, quite often it's getting more challenging to segment the consumer because quite often people use different things at different times. So who can be a member of a very luxury club and also a member of a, a budget club. And it, the, the life, generally speaking, is more integrated than ever. So I start with that because I think when it comes to technology, it has to be integrated, right? You know, if you really want to make it work, and the big winners of COVID have been obviously the online platforms that were set up previously, who were doing a great job. At There's been a rush, obviously, during this last few months for every operator to get a presence online and a pumping out. But it has to be more than a bolt-on, right? It has to be much more thought through and much more integrated into a holistic experience. So when, uh, as Sean said and Andrew referred to, you know, the experience has to be total. So in other words, that you use a club one day, next day you may work out at home. And I think what we'll see now is people are almost got used to working out at home with the different platforms and different exercises. It needs to be thought through in regards to how that integrates back into the club. And then they do not they support each other. I think it needs to be thought in that way of how it integrates best. Um, and then obviously for the for the model for the model for the for the operators that have the physical hardware, you know, it also gives it a little and flexibility if this happens again, if the online digital presence is strong, but actually a truly integrated experience which flows through the total holistic experience of people's lives. Very nice point, my friend. I think we can all learn that probably the more integration we have within our industry and within our services and provisions, then ultimately the, the better we are, the more holistic we become, which for both uh, our consumers and ultimately for our employees makes uh, the best sense. Uh, so now I'm going to move swiftly on to our uh, last point for uh, today. And then after that, I'll hopefully be able to take some of the audience's questions. I really do apologize that Barbara has been unable to join us. It is 3 a.m. for her currently, so quite late. Uh, but hopefully we'll try and bring her back for the audience's questions. For now, the last point is going to be, will we see more investment going into innovative lighting, flooring, sound, audio, visual, and different aspects of design as companies try to become more differentiated from their competitors. Obviously, there are restrictions with spending in this period, but as mentioned, gents, we, we do think it's going to end. We do think the recovery stage is beginning and will go back to normal. So what do you see the future being in that respect? And I'll go again quickly to Andrew, Sean, and then Jamie. Andrew, sure. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak specifically to lighting, AV, and sound uh, just because of the nature of, of our business. Uh, but what, what what I can speak to is experiences and uh, the experiential uh, state of going into a gym. I think, you know, Sean, what, what he has with TFX in Singapore, what I saw, I mean, it's it's truly an experience to go go into that club. It's it's very different, and you know, as we as a manufacturer, we're looking at how can we take hardware and create it to where it can be experiential. And you know, two examples: um, ICG, one of the brands that you listed, um, Coach by Color. That's that is a experience. It's something that we we promote and we drive quite actively. Um, I think another one that we just launched uh, recently is Life Fitness on Demand, and it's coaching on console. So you can you can get on a console, you connect your Bluetooth headphones, and you have a coach that is giving you instruction, telling you what to do. So I, I, I don't necessarily know if it's it's really AV or lighting or, or flooring, but I think um, bringing a unique experience to customers is really what's going to be important as we go forward. Absolutely, my friend. I think any way you can differentiate as a brand, Perhaps in this question, it's much more design focused on the, the raw elements. But I think as a provider, you've got a really good input as to how this uh, comes about, how you showcase your equipment and how that equipment is actually positioned in certain ways to make it very different from every other standard uh, 
uh, provider. So uh, I'll move swiftly over to Sean, uh, who's uh, Jim's TFX and uh, ultimately True Fitness have been both by uh, Andrew and also by James Blower uh, and myself uh, sampled and they are state of the art. So Sean, if you can just give us your quick input on this, thank you. Um, thanks, Blair. Um, whether or not we'll be, we'll be spending more on the stuff like lighting and, 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 and design, I think at the moment, uh, for at least the next six to 12 months, what we'll do is, I think we've done enough. We've pushed that, that envelope and, and, and we've done enough, but more of our investment will be on the technology front to see how we can explore um, the boundaries of technology and, and in a way incorporate design and experience within technology to see how that brings our members to a different place, uh, enhances the experience. Because what we really want to do is enhancing experience online as well. Um, I think if we manage to pull that off and we do that well, I think that would be a perfect complement to the physical clubs that we have. And it buys us time to see where the industry develops in the next six and 12, uh, 12 months with COVID and uh, to see whether on the physical side, we push the boundaries you know, even more with design and, and everything else. But for now, I think we've done enough. Now it's sort of wait and see and see how everybody sort of responds to, to, to what we've got in the offering. It is earlier, right? I think with existing developments, it's hard to things. I think a lot of a lot of you, a lot of what you said before, when you're talking about new facilities and how they're going to be designed and how they're going to be looking towards that luxury market and, and meeting those ultimately um, specifications that they seek is going to be something we're going to find in time will reveal itself. I'll come last now to you, Jamie, before we answer some of the audience's questions. So look, I, I think for me, I mean, it's obviously difficult to talk about specifics. I mean, it, it goes back to concept and your kind of strategic thrust of your business of how you design and what you do. I think it's wrong to try and look at um, you know, opportunistically at changing design based on the current situation because it's too short term and actually has to make sense for your model, right? It has to make sense for the returns you're looking for and, and more importantly, what's your concept and what's your new selling point. So if that's part of, is, if lighting and UV is part of your concept, great, go for it, make it as attractive as possible. Of course, one thing is businesses and that is in the end, quality wins, right? So whatever your concept executes it best, it's not and therefore I think it's, it, this is an opportunity for people to review and reflect because one thing is for sure, you know, the investment guys are looking at every penny that would be spent moving forward in regards to you know how we're designing clubs and you know, the, 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 the nimbleness if I can say that or the flexibility around the design in regards to investment as well has to work uh, and therefore I think it has to be aligned to the, the overall strategy and focus of that business um, of course if you design you know great facilities and that's a big part of your concept yes you know, but again you need to really examine you know to spend you need to examine the return of you can get or need based on your model and your strategy, I'd say. Very aptly put, gents. Uh, love that. So unfortunately, Barbara's not able to come back to us at this point in time. We have officially answered the, the questions that we, we posed initially. So now I'm going to try and bring in the audience. There has been one or two questions from the audience, which almost mirror some of the questions we had in our last session. Um, and that is to do with the hygiene and the the air distribution within health clubs and gyms. I think for, for me personally, one of the things that came through from the last session was that a lot of luxury brands and premium providers, both in health clubs, gyms and fitness, are currently doing exceptional protocols and it's simply making this more visible to others. We can also use things like UV technology, uh, limit, for example, uh, contact uh, appropriate things for keys and lockers and we can also do things like air ionizations through uh, air con filters which work very well at cleaning air. I'm going to try and now ask uh, each of you if you've got any knowledge of current technologies, future things that you may employ in your businesses uh, provide your clients to aid the ability to make your facilities more pristine for hygiene and uh, large group interactions. 
Uh, let's start first of all with uh, Sean, if you don't mind. And I'll come to Andrew and then Jamie last. Sure. Um, before we were locked down, at the end of March, we were open for two weeks with a lot of restrictions. So we have some experience in this. But I think I would start by saying this. No matter what we do in the gyms and the studios, um, to be honest, we'll never be able to create a 100% infectant uh, sterile environment. We won't. We won't. A lot of it is optics. A lot of it is restoring uh, you know, confidence in the members to come back. So I think the very basics will have to be there. You know, Temperature taking, cleaning, sanitization. They, your members have to see you do it more regularly. And whether or not a certain solution, I mean, I, we've spoken with so many uh, providers of, of cleaning and disinfectant solutions. And you, if you ask them a simple question, which one of your solutions uh, has been proven scientifically to kill the COVID virus? The answer will always come back. Actually, we have not really tested it because we weren't able to, the lab are busy trying to find the odd antibody, but we can tell we can tell you all the other viruses and all the other bacteria that this is effective on. So they can't tell you for sure. Even UV, um, you know, we we have a, we the parent company, we've got another company which has, They've employed UV tech next to the, the to the to the HVAC controls, uh, the heating and ventilation, air conditioning, and and this is more than ten odd, odd years. Um, it's an expensive solution, but if you ask me, does that kill the COVID nineteen virus? I'm not sure, and they can't tell you either. But will it give confidence to members coming in? Absolutely, yes. And the more of these things you want to employ uh, and, and you want to put into your clubs, the the I guess the more the confidence level. But as an operator, you're always having to do that and balancing it that with costs, you know, and um, that, that's the reality. So um, I think there will be a minimum. I think the industry will find our balance and we'll look around and see what our competitors are doing and whatever they are doing, we'll do. We might put a little bit more. But more than that, I don't think we'll go to the extremities, you know. That's good. There has to be a balance of, of being able to clean and restoring the premises that it looks inviting and at the same time not doing so so much so that it looks as if you're going into some sort of CDC control area uh, and scaring people off. So I'm going to come to you Andrew and then Jamie on this question as well. Andrew go ahead. Yeah I think we've we've uh, we've seen our fair share of products that have come out in the last 60 days from uh, different barriers and air purifiers and uh, you know, machines that you walk in and it, it sprays you and it's supposed to disinfect you. And, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more with what Sean is saying. It really comes down to uh, the perception by customers and consumer confidence. And, you know, I, I think it's fundamentally it's, it's blocking and tackling. You've got to be hygienic. You've got to wipe down equipment. You are going to have to step up. There's going to be some additional costs that you're going to have to invest in. Uh, so that that is going to happen. Um, but but again, uh, I think it just comes down to the perception of the customer. The, o the only other things I would add is uh, having the opportunity to see this uh, throughout all of Asia Pacific, having ties to the U.S. Um, man, government regulations are all over the map. So I think you know, for operators, if I was to give any piece of advice, what we did in our office in Hong Kong with our local employees is we followed government recommendations. That's kind of all you can do because of the wide spectrum. The second thing I would say is humans have a very short memory. And just like at the start of this call when Jamie said, this is not going to last forever, this is not going to last forever. And what's going to be interesting to see is when these new um, hygienic methods are employed, what happens when the virus does eventually go away and a new operator wants to open up and they've got a full suite of equipment and they can charge a lower price or equal price with a better experience because they haven't had to invest. So that's, it, it's definitely going to be a balancing act for operators over the next three, six, nine months. Can you yeah, hear me? Think, yeah, we we lost Blair? Blair might have some issues with this connectivity. So let me, uh, I'll go ahead and answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So from, look, from my perspective and, um, you know, again, again, I think one, it's important to note, yes, you have to be compliant with guidelines, of course, of our ability to follow all these regulations. 
Um, without trying to be controversial, I do agree totally with Sean and Andrew. It's optics, a lot of it. A lot of it is actually to give confidence in regards to your consumers. Because the reality is, you know, we, we're exposed to multiple viruses every day. And true immunology and strength is, is how do you, you know, how do you really help yourself to be healthy? You know, then this is the business we're in. And the best thing people can do for themselves is to eat well, to move, exercise, and have, have some form of mindfulness in their lives to reduce stress and so forth. These things will actually support massively people's health, much more than being over sterilized, because over sterilization is really not how you build great safety. You know, this is the reality of, of health. Um, so I think there's a lot of it is optics, and I think a lot of people are, um, you know, we need to demonstrate that we obviously level uh to make sure people are confident but to be over sterilized doesn't really help us in the long term so much um obviously in the, in the more luxury type of product that we can afford to have you know air filters and we can have afford, afford to have to control the environment because that's part of the concept anyway and i think that's obviously a luxury most um most operators in a volume driven business don't have but i think so in summary i think we have to look to the best way to be compliant, but in regards to safe, healthy and sensible guidelines, but going too far, it's not a, it's not a kind of point of difference. You know, it's a qualifier and we can't use it as, you know, at a competitive advantage because we are seen to have been better realization. I think the customer needs to understand that we all have well, as a base level, there's enough there to people feel comfortable and safe. Um, but that's a basic expectation. I think we'll all have to demonstrate of absolutely thanks jamie I've, I've jumped in gents just to make sure we can uh, finish the panel on time uh, andrew maybe your thoughts on some of the customer expectations that you're facing on design now i mean we, i think we're just gonna, we'll, we'll finish off the question with sean what are your customers now asking of you and is it really possible to implement everything that they want um given given the restrictions around yeah, I think you know we we partially covered this in the in the very beginning of the interview, but it's it's really uh, uh, customers, so operators, owners, uh, gym chains are coming to us as a manufacturer, and they're saying, what what, what do we do? How do we um, how do we move your equipment around? How do we do a layout um, that gives our members a sense of safety and security? So um, as I kind of said before, the existing customers. Uh, we are happy to help them, happy to assist with what a layout should look like, uh, some reopening guidelines that were, were published over the last couple of weeks. And then lastly, with new customers, it's just coming up with creative ways uh, to open new clubs without having uh, a gym just completely packed where people feel, 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 feel safe. Thanks, Jens. I'll leave you in Blair's very capable hands. Blair, we, we don't, don't have audio. I hear you, Blair. You know, when we were talking about technology earlier, if we came up with a really good video conferencing <laughs> platform, we'd be really good. Um, Big fortune. What we can do, gents, is we've got a minute left. Maybe we can think about what you're most positively looking forward to in the next six to 12 months. Uh, Sean, what are you most looking forward to in the next 12 to six months? <laughs> Reopening in full and having, having the gyms packed again. The members are raring to go, um, but we just want to, to be able to reopen safely um, and get back to business um, as close to normal as possible. Uh, Jamie? Um, look, I, I think um, to be, you know, I'm actually very optimistic. I think this is a really pivotal point in our human evolution in regards to this happening because it's made us all reflect and look at what's important. And I think you know so that's from a more esoteric perspective, let's say. But from a commercial, I'm also very optimistic because one thing is true in that you know health is wealth. This is the business we're in, and people, you know, this this whole experience has let people see that we need to invest in our health. You know, and uh, so I think it's a boy, it'll be a buoyant time. I think we're going to six to 12 months will be tough for a lot of people to survive. But I think the, the brands and the organizations that can survive will thrive beyond that. Andrew, what are you looking forward to? 
predictability. I mean, I think Mike, Mike Lamb said that uh, in the keynote, you, you take a best guess at your club openings, uh, your member rate, um, and, and that's what it is. It's your best guess. It's, uh, I'm sure Sean can appreciate this. Jamie can appreciate this. Uh, as a as a you know a business leader, a general manager, whatever position you're in, if you're trying to navigate these tough times, predictability is going to be very welcome in the next few months. Excellent. Well, gents, that will close us off at um, four fifteen. It's the end of the session, so I want to thank you very much for your time, gents. And um, we will record this session, as you know, and it will be sent to everybody on Friday morning. Um, small edits at the beginning and the end, but Jamie, Sean, Andrew, and Blair. Thank you very much for joining us today, gents. Godspeed, and uh, we'll see you again very soon. And thanks thank to all the audience for attending. Thank you, thank you gents. Thank, thank you, you audience. Thank you guys. And we'll Bye. see you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.